This video will cover the topic of box models, and we're going to apply it to the hydrologic cycle. And later during the week, we will look at um, how to apply it to different elemental and geochemical cycles. So for the purpose of, so before we get started on uh, talking about the hydrologic cycle, I want to kind of look at some of the properties of water and remind all of us why water is such a special uh, substance. So first of all, it has a tremendous heat capacity, one of the highest of all uh, materials. And so what that means is per gram of water, it can hold a lot of heat and keep it there. We notice that when we say warm up water on the stove, that water will stay warm for quite some time. This is also true for our oceans and other natural water bodies in that they hold a lot of heat that's collected from the sun. This allows our climate on Earth to be fairly moderate, um, even at the extreme uh, latitudes, the northern and southern latitudes. And that is relative to other planets. Water also has a very high heat of fusion, which is a melting point, heat of evaporation or boiling point, and also has a fairly high surface tension. All three of these things, what that's due to is the fact that water undergoes hydrogen bonding. And so hydrogen bonding is a very important uh, property of water. And the last thing I would just note is the viscosity of water. Because water is a small molecule, it has a fairly low viscosity, meaning it flows fairly well. So now let's look at box models and how to use them to understand geochemical cycles. So what we're going to do in these box models is we're going to compartmentalize the Earth. We're going to just determine what systems we would want to study. And in most of these cases, we'll say we'll separate, say, the ocean with the land, with the atmosphere, and we can even break it down into smaller pieces. Like on land, we can say lakes and glaciers. In the ocean, we can call it the deep ocean separate from the surface ocean. It all depends on how we want to compartmentalize the Earth. We're going to call each of those compartments a reservoir. And then what we're going to do is we're going to determine how the substance or elements transfer between each of these reservoirs. And so we have the easy part in that we can use scientific data to help us understand how these elements cycle or move through the Earth system. The hard part was that scientists had to determine how much is in each reservoir and how much transfers in and out of that reservoir. So that data is known. It's a, something that scientists continue to study, but we can use that data to understand the cycling. And so one key piece of information that we can get out of these calculations is the mean residence time. And so the mean residence time will tell us how long a given substance stays in a reservoir. And that might not sound important to you now, but as we start piecing this together, it will really help us understand how a given element or substance cycles. And it puts everything in perspective so that we can make more uh, intelligent decisions about um, how to go about solving, say, a problem like climate change. 
And so the mean residence time will be taking in how much is in each reservoir, we'll call it the inventory, and dividing it by the flux. The flux is the transfer or rate of change of that substance over time. So we've all studied the hydrologic cycle, and in many times we've studied it using a cartoon like what's on this slide. I've used this slide for decades teaching elementary school students about the water cycle. And so we all know, and where we start with this, is that water evaporates into the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, the water vapor and, and condensation can move great distances where in places such as over high elevation, it will rain and precipitate back down to land and then return to the water bodies in which it evaporated. And so we understand this cycle very well. Also part of this cycle, let's not forget, is the groundwater. Um, that is another reservoir that we can talk about later. But we can break this down into more of a scientific and numerical study of the hydrologic cycle. So this is the box model for the hydrologic cycle. And so what we have here is three main boxes. We have seawater, atmosphere, and freshwater. We also have in the seawater and freshwater, we broke it, broken it down even further into smaller compartments, separating the surface and deep waters of the ocean and the ice, lakes, and groundwater on land in terms of uh, freshwater sources. The arrows are showing the fluxes. They're showing how uh, water is moving, and this is in units of kilometers cubed per year from each of the compartments. And so we'll use those in our calculations. And so I would like you to have a, hopefully a printed copy of this so you can follow along uh, with the calculations later in the video. There's a few points I want to make about the hydrologic cycle. First, the hydrologic cycle is responsible for the weathering of rocks, and this material is transported from the mountains and the uplifts down to the ocean. This plays an important role in other elemental cycles that we'll study later on. Also, the hydrologic cycle is responsible for distributing water over the surface of the earth. And that is uh, very important as well. When referring to the last box model I showed you on the hydrologic cycle, what is noticeable is that the atmosphere has a very small inventory, very small, but it's a very important reservoir in that that is the means by which the water does distribute over the surface of the earth. And the last uh, point I want to make is that the hydrologic cycle is in a steady state. That means that the fluxes between each reservoir and the fluxes in and the fluxes out are the same. That is not what we'll see for, say, the carbon cycle or the nitrogen cycle, which is very disturbed by anthropogenic activities. The water cycle in its grandness, I mean, it's, 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 it's a very huge cycle. It is yet to be disturbed in a large way by anthropogenic activities. It is, we say, in a steady state. So again, I would like you to have a copy of this off to the side so that you can refer to this as we do the next calculation. 
So to end this video, we're going to answer one question. And we're going to use the box model for the hydrologic cycle to do so. So how long does it take to complete the hydrologic cycle? For example, what I mean by that, how long does it take for the entire ocean to evaporate, precipitate over land, and return back to the ocean? And this is on average, meaning we're going to use mean residence times to determine on average how long does it take a water molecule to evaporate, go over land, precipitate, and return back to the ocean. So we can answer this question by calculating the mean residence time of water in each reservoir, which will give us the average time a water molecule spends in each of these reservoirs. So that's going to be our approach. And so perhaps before you go on with the video, how long do you think that would take? How long does it take for that process to happen? So let's start with the ocean. And so in order to calculate the mean residence time, what I'll need to do is I'll need to find the inventory and I'll need to find the flux. Given that this system is in the steady state, meaning the flux in is the same as the flux out, then I have options here in terms of how to determine how much is leaving and going. So what I've done is I've looked at, on the figure 1.1, I've looked at how much is actually going out in terms of precipitation. So this is uh, water leaving the ocean in the form of precipitation. However, a lot of the precipitation actually rains down back into the ocean. So I've subtracted that back out because what I'm interested in is how much actually goes on land. So uh, when I make that subtraction, I get 0 0.0837, which I do find is the same as what runs back to the ocean. And you see that on figure 1.1 as well. So this is my flux. This is the transfer of water in kilometers cubed per year. And so this is the net out and the net in to the ocean. So that's my flux. In terms of my inventory, what I do is I add the amount in uh, kilometers cubed times 10 to the 6, I add the amounts from the surface ocean and the deep ocean together. And that is my total inventory in the ocean. And so from that, what I find is that the mean residence time that a water molecule spends in the ocean is actually 37,000 years. So that's the length of time on average that a water molecule spends in the ocean. So once the water leaves the ocean after a very long time, it does make its way on the land. And we can do a similar calculation of the mean residence time on land. So again, with the inventories, we use the inventories of fresh water, of ice, of groundwater. We add them all up and we divide them by the flux. And again, the precipitation on land 
and the runoff to the ocean, that flux is 0 0.037 times 10 to the 6 cubic kilometers per year. And so what we get on average is that water molecules spend about a thousand years on land. Now again, this is an average. You can imagine a water molecule uh, raining down in Arcata and flowing into ocean, it might only take a few days to return back to the ocean. But you also get water molecules locked away in an ice cap on Greenland, or maybe it leaches down into the soil and ends up in a freshwater aquifer and spends thousands of years or maybe millions of years in one of those reservoirs. So again, this is an average uh, calculation, but nonetheless, we do get um, useful information out of these sorts of calculations. So given that we have land and ocean mean residence times, we can now figure out how long it takes to complete the cycle. Just one, one piece of information though, uh, I did not calculate the mean residence time of the atmosphere. And maybe I should have, and maybe you should do that on your own time and figure out how many years a water molecule on average stays in the atmosphere. For this calculation, it's extremely negligible, but maybe you should determine how many days on average a water molecule spends in the atmosphere. So given that the atmosphere is on a time scale of days, here we're talking thousands of years, for a water molecule, to evaporate, go over land, and return back into the ocean, on average, that process takes 38,000 years. And so we'll use these sorts of calculations again as we um, investigate other geochemical cycles.